Welcome. This is the September 27th Jail and Zones call. We have Jan B., Dan L., Florian H., Mohammed N., Dave C.H., and Goran, and myself, Michael, so far. I'm sure others will drop in. Uh, proof of concept number one, Jan is using FreeBSD Chromium and Zoom to attend, and we did try a screen share earlier, which worked. So if you are hoping to dog food, there's a way to do it. Uh, from the frustrating news department, the Euro Beehive Con recording was simply a webcam in the corner and the audio is kind of terrible in the echoey room. So I will probably not post that, but if you really, really want to see it, you can follow along and try to like read lips. And uh, Dan and Jan were talking about time capsule in a jail, which is a neat topic all its own that we might address at the very end. And Mohammed, you had a comment on pod life cycle. What is that? Do you have a quick rundown? Uh, from previous call, we there was a couple of topics that we mentioned. Maybe we look at uh, other tools and see, or hopefully learn how they did it. And that looked to me a bit similar to what, or one of the ideas that Jan uh, explained how to react or follow up on states of jail. At least uh, from my own experience, specifically. Yeah. Yes, ahead. yeah. At least from my own little experience, it reads similar to one of his ideas. So maybe if you can look at it and. Okay, Jan, that is linked. Give it a look, and we'll, we can all take a look at that. Uh, someone's definitely done their homework here. I appreciate that. And Goran, are you available to tell us about Jail Envy List? Or has he dropped off the call? He's dropped off. Uh, so Goran has been busy, and he's posted, uh, updated as recently as like within the hour, a repo that is the FreeBSD repo. So it's a little hard to tease out what is exactly the new code, but he's been busy with a, a, a project he described uh, in recent calls. You can just look it's at the list of commits. It's quite easy to tease out the new code if you scroll up to the top mm -hmm. and click on seven commits ahead. Yep. Totally, let's take a look. You get the change sets. Ta -da. Seven hours ago, great. One hour ago. I like the sound of documentation. Let's see what that gives us while. So just to get some context for um, um, for Florian and anyone else who's new, what we were talking about here is the um, current kernel user land interface for jails involves um, building um, an array of IVX and you put sort of the name of the parameter in one and then you put the uh, well, in one pair and then you put the actual value in the second pair and um, Goran is looking at um, envy list as a, a, a cleaner way of doing this and the initial stuff he did um, that I saw earlier in the week is more straightforward to use um, and the idea behind it is from his perspective is that um, we should be able to use this envy list approach not just for jails but for anything where we're marshalling data in from user land into the kernel and back again. He is back connecting to audio. Goran, are you good to go? Uh, yes. Sorry, I'm. Oh, I'm not muted. Okay, cool. Welcome. Uh, I have a call, and I'm on phone with the Zoom, so of course priority is to do. Welcome on. Provider. <laughs> uh, do you want me to explain the the proposal? Or... That would be great. And we just did a quick little look at your repo while you were connecting, and your changes. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you want to describe it or give a demo or something in between? Uh, I would like to describe it. Okay. I think it's pretty abstract right now. Okay. Uh, so just one step back uh, to give you the context. Uh, today, if you want so to save some metadata with the jail, you can't. There is no structure to actually store the data. So this is the 
Well, it started as experiment and proof of concept. What I'm hoping for is that it's going to grow into the uh, full-fledged uh, PR. Anyway, uh, the use case is um, Patch is totally writing where you could say vna.interface equal auto and it would auto create the interface and uh, replace the auto with what the value is like e pair 15a or b or whatever. So that when you use it as a, a variable in your configuration, jailconf, uh, it just magically works. And sorting works, creating works, but uh, there is no place where you can save the um, what interface was assigned to a jail on creation. And well, there are clumsy ways, but not not an actual good way to to set it. Uh, so I come from that prism. Uh, I look the this envious problem is the, the through that prism. What if we could save arbitrary data and uh, kernel probably up to some size and act upon it? Uh, when you're stopping, listing, or whatever you're doing, you, you could somehow query the data and uh, do something accordingly. So NLS proved to be really great for communication, not so much for storing. Uh, to be precise, editing something that exists in an NLS uh, is really, really clumsy. So for now, I'm abusing the envelope for storing the data in the kernel. But talking to Jamie, uh, he doesn't like it. I don't like it. And uh, I gave serious thought to what uh, Jan suggested with cache table. But I really don't like how it would be say with inserting data into arrays. With, you would have to shift stuff. And so we're gonna have to, to think hard how to actually store it, but the communication works. And let's say in a, uh, th that Envy list is good for now for storing data, then everything kind of works. And everything means that you can uh, currently set anything to envy list in the uh, jail parameter called envy params. And maybe best start with uh, my edits to man page. There's a short as it can be uh, example at the end, uh, a little C code. So uh, what about a CD? I don't know, I have to, uh, I have to read a lot. Uh, a little bit of disclaimer. I did graduate IT, but they never taught me C, C++, anything system. We didn't even set an IP. So this is actually me learning about the kernel, not yet implementing it as a, as I want to. So to give an answer uh, to Dave and Jan, I have no idea which structure I need to use. I'm still researching, but I never I need to use envelope to communicate because of the support and the user space. So, um, yeah. The short form that I would recommend is to look just from because it works in user space as well. Um, there is a header called tree.h. It has a main page called tree. Uh, which basically contains really cursed C macros, which once you uh, expand, have a compiler expand them, um, expand into a red black tree implementation for your data type. It's nice for kernel work because it's intrusively linked. So basically uh, you have a root pointer, which could be part of a jail struct, and then you have the key value paths and they contain the linkage fields internally so you don't have to 
allocate that dynamically. Yeah. And um, yes, that go and the main page uh, includes an example usage of it. Cool. This, so under examples, there's a small example program. And that basically can be used as a reasonably performant key value map. So oh, it's something it. like a tail queue. Oh, uh, I mean, the no, API is kind of... Yeah, but it is... Can, so the int CMP in this case is the comparison function. Uh, you give it mm -hmm. to the RB generate macro as shown a few lines lower. The augmentation stuff you can probably completely ignore. And what this then does is it creates the code to be used uh, to access the data structure. And cool. Yeah. I will definitely study that and see where I can. So go the implementation with. is truly cursed, but it works. It's commonly used. I wouldn't want to to have anyone suffer to write it again, but it has been done. It's battle tested. It works. Do you have yes, examples exactly. of well, kernel components using that? Uh, just grab for the RB generate macro name okay. in the source code, and you will find all the uses of it. There may be an even nicer thing for just inside the kernel, but it should. I don't know of any reason why it shouldn't work. And it's easy to use. Cool. I also seen OSD throughout the jail implementation. So I will definitely see how it's used uh, currently. And uh, I think I've seen it. Anyway, yeah, there, there was a research ahead of me on how to store the data. And of course, Jamie has to agree with it. Otherwise, this is all fairy tale. But for now, he didn't say no. It's a proof of concept, which started with me really hammering the code down. Uh, the nice thing about MLS working in the user and kernel space is that you can write a function in a user space and then just copy paste it into kernel, and it magically works. Uh, so I was totally abusing that fact and try to write everything in user space that I could. That way, right, my virtual machine or the whole computer doesn't die. Um, so I started with a really crude patch that would implement CCTL, avoid all the locking, all the sanity in the kernel was bypassed. So just for me to save the MV list, and I polished it up. One thing I learned, uh, for example, about the syscalls, or at least the jail set and jail guest syscalls, how you're going to set, well, that's easy. You're going to send the kernel uh, IOVS, which has only two things. It's a pointer to memory, is one variable, and the second one is how long in bytes, how long that blob is. So it's called IOV underscore base and IOV underscore line. And uh, that's, that's used to communicate with the kernel. Uh, I'm going to, whenever I say to the kernel in this context, I mean specifically jail set and jail yet. Uh, so setting something from the user space, you're going to generate some data. Uh, you're going to serialize it. Say, OK, this is. I don't know, 35 bytes long or whatever, with alignment probably <clears throat> uh, something like 64 or whatever. And you're going to send that to the kernel. And the kernel is going to get the size and then copy in, it's literally the name of the uh, uh, function, copy in the data from the user space to kernel space. When you're getting something, there is fixed size like integer, you know, it's four bytes and no problem. But when you're getting something like a string, or in this case, something like uh, uh, envelope, uh, which is packed as a stream of bytes, it's arbitrary size. And you have to uh, 
basically you have to do three things. First, you're asking the kernel, how big the size is? No, how big the data is that you're about to send me? Uh, for one six call, when you get that data, then you allocate memory that's that byte long, and then you get the actual data by sending it also IOVAC and the length of the data you expect to, to get from the kernel. Now, I was always wondering what if some, something happens between getting the size and getting the data. And actually, it doesn't matter in this case. And I'm going to explain why. Um, first thing, if length of the data that the kernel is trying to send the user space is not exactly the length of the user space uh, sending as a parameter through I of X. Is it going to break? So one thing is for sure, if you get data for syscall, it's the the length you were asked uh, kernel to get you. Even if there is more space in the user space than in a kernel, if the lengths don't match totally, it's going to break. It's going to error out. Uh, so first thing is you know that the size of the data is what you ask. And second thing is every list, <clears throat> sorry, every list starts with the three numbers and they are characters converted to, to uh, numbers. It, it says NVL. So if your data arrives from the kernel and your uh, portion of NVL of a stream of bytes produced the envy list. You know it was envy list when it was sent. So even if something got updated uh, between getting the size and getting the data, you would actually get the newer data if it was changed. Uh, if some integer was, I don't know, uh, increased to one or something trivial like that. So, uh, I have to say, I now have a little bit more confidence in uh, modern computing now that I understand how it actually works. Uh, and it was one of the big questions for me personally, because uh, getting the data and getting the, the size of it is a pretty was a pretty big unknown to me how it actually downs under the hood. So, go on. Yes. While in theory, the in the system call context, a kernel can access pointers it has received from user space. It can't trust them and can't directly access them because potentially an other threat could just make the kernel crash by um, changing the pointers to, to uh, address, maybe unmapping it, and you would get a page fold in the kernel, which would be fatal. Uh, the proper way to access is it is to use something like UIO move, uh, which oh, is yeah, a function yeah. to, to copy data in and out. Uh, for very big data, you may want to set up kernel mappings for the addresses. Let's say if you were to give a one gigabyte piece of data to the kernel, yeah, then you wouldn't want to copy it. You would want to do clever tricks with virtual memory, but for things like configuration parameters, just copy them. And if you have copied them, then you look at them and you try to not have to do validation, but be very careful to make do all the validation. Don't trust any internal length fields for variable size data in an array of bytes or something. Uh, you really have to double check after the copy because if you look at it again, uh, so if you were to lock down the memory, it's, it can't be unmapped. Look at it, look at it again, then it could have changed in between. Uh, so yeah, the kernel has to take a copy and there are dedicated functions to make uh, that easy. Uh, the 
FreeBSD device drivers for the Intrepid book, while it's dated, uh, it contains the code for it and an explanation of how the functions are supposed to be used and so on. By the way, read the, the great book, I read it, I don't know, I think three times. And uh, even if when I was not writing any kernel side code, it was revealing to, to see what's under the hood. So anyway, well, the idea with the example is that you can set and get partial data, uh, meaning that it can be well partial and, uh, and the whole. Uh, you can set the whole envy list, or you can just say, okay, to the existing envy list, add this one parameter, uh, one attribute, uh, or you can filter out the attribute, the attributes that you can get from the kernel by asking it for whatever. Currently, only the arbitrary data is written, not the, the jail, like ID, allow, underscore, whatever, exec, uh, right? It, it has its own variable, and I didn't want to touch that in a proof of concept, but it would be nice to communicate all the parameters, to be able to communicate all the parameters for envy list to something, some process requiring it. Uh, so uh, current example in a man page shows uh, how do you uh, get and set stuff partially, but if you just ignore the partial part and your IOVAC array is smaller because you're not sending partial data. It's going to basically work if you just lower, uh, or throw out the, the partial parts. Uh, why well, didn't state anything that already exists in a kernel is because we're almost sure the envy list is not going to be used for storing, so I didn't bother doing that. Also, the filtering of attributes in a get call is done only uh, for one level. It doesn't traverse through the nested envy list and does the stuff. So it's Simple, the example works, and I didn't test it much outside of it. Uh, but yeah, not, not bad for a weekend. <laughs> uh, the next is, well, I'll definitely check out the tree and LCD. And if they are used in a jail in any capacity, I think OCD is, but I have to check. Uh, so. I don't know, maybe OCD, if it's already used, it, it would uh, make sense to just continue using it. But in any case, I will research both. And if anything else comes my way, I will also look at it. Is a demo appropriate or we're good? No, we're good. Cool. Well, Thank you so, so much. I'm just. For I'm just some, copying something to curl to it and from it, so there's no much thing to demo. It was um, funny with you. It makes a lot more sense now um, what what you're doing and why the um, wrapping the envy list in the J in the uh, IOVIC is, is required, or at least required initially. Well, if the syscall was uh designed completely to work only with envy list, I have X could be redundant. But jail set and jail get are already implemented as uh syscalls and on a kernel side they I didn't have to care about any locking anything. I just followed the path that was already established for other parameters, and it was wonderful. For uh, somebody who likes copy-paste, I was enjoying that one.
Well, do stay in touch with Jamie on the design. And I'm glad you've made so much progress since like meeting last week. Excellent. I'm, I'm constantly talking to Jamie. I'm going to have to, to, to kind of put it through a dominant and send less emails for everything I change. But yeah, once I have a next suggestion, he's going to be first to hear it. And hopefully we will settle on some structure and start polishing the patch. Excellent. And Jan, does this track with your ideas for preserving state at every step? Or is that orthogonal? Um, we pretty specific last time about yeah. what that can look like. This is a sp special case. So it's nice that it's there. It's useful as it is. Um, the idea, but it's not the tracking st state ch and uh, especially state changes okay. uh, across multiple parts of the system that it doesn't cover and it shouldn't because it's not the design goal here. It's that you ca can have a place to preserve state. Got uh, it. In the kernel in this case, so that basically you can trust that as long as there's a kernel to run your code on, uh, it's there, which is why it's so useful. Um, of course, you could just put it in a file system under some uh, var db jail or something uh, and just keep a, have a, sub, a key value there. You would just have var jail, jail yep. ID, and then or the, and then it should probably be under var run if you were to go down that route. Just put it under var run, jail, jail ID, and then the key value pairs. Well, keep us posted on your but, visions yeah. and proofs of concept. Uh, yeah, that would be a topic for a bit later. Cool. Let's finish up with current stuff first. Yep. So a follow up on last right. week, uh, Dave correctly nudged me on finding a home for a consolidated features list. So I've posted that in the doc. It's wide open for contribution. And I know Dave has both an MD doc and other napkin notes to put in there. So Dave, is that adequate? Yeah, so just one thing I've, I've printed out and about halfway through um, all 100 pages of um, jail notes that, um, that that Michael's diligently made. Good. So hold off, okay. hold off a day, a day or two for me to finish that. But it's 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 going well. But basically, what I want to do is try and arrange them in some sort of logical order. So, for example, we've talked about event notification, state machines, um, all of those sorts of things, and they kind of all go together. And um, yeah, that should be ready probably today or tomorrow. Um, and then we can review it next week and start prioritizing slash picking up ones that people want to do. And um, once we've got an order, um, each week I'll pick off three or four and go back to the main jails list and um, get some more feedback. Yep. Lorian, thanks for joining. It sounds like you need to drop yep. off. Glad you made Thank it. Thank you for slogging through that. <laughs> he loved it. He'll tell his family about it. Okay, well, so thank you, Dave, because that's a, 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 a housekeeping function I have not had the capacity to do after each meeting. But hey, here's the handoff. Thank you so much for picking it up. There's the baton. Um, Antrenig, you have been working on scientific Linux. It's slightly orthogonal, but it's a question of reaching out to the scientific community and our community, yes. which have been very active on, say, various Linux environments, but uh, you are engaging, I believe, the university locally and find yourself needing to be a defender, advocate, or promote FreeBSD. Do you want to give a rundown on this? Sure. So I come with both good news and bad news. The good news is when we set up FreeBSD on the two terabyte machine um, and I used Linux jails, um, everything worked fine from a user's perspective. Uh, even complex applications that are written in high-level languages like Java, uh, JVM, etc., they didn't have any problems. But then I had problems, specifically uh, anything that is related to debuggability was not working. 
a uh, very good example of this would be when a user or a scientist, let's put it in this way, runs a Java application and they report to me that it's not working, which is scientific talk for, I don't know how computers work, help me to understand what is this doing. And, you know, it's a Java application. So my first response is to use something like JSTAC to get the uh, stack trace of the Java application. In a Linux jail, the debugging utilities basically don't work. Uh, they assume a lot of things in ProtzFS, which are not in the bare minimum that we implemented. And the list goes on for other parts of, ap of applications as well. So uh, even C level, uh, well, C++ applications, when I start debugging them, uh, the debugger would, would just practically crash. So it was not a good idea to run Linux jails. Um, did you mount Lin debuff? Yes, I don't know. Do tell we... us more about that, Jan. Yeah. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. No, and it, and a lot of things that still didn't work. Uh, you mean the, uh, Linux and the debug FS? Yeah, no, and it still didn't work. Um, unfortunately, my um, team decided to go with uh, Linux. Uh, we went with Gento for now, um, and they are running uh, typical Ubuntu containers for the uh, team. Um, but at the same time, we have decided to keep a, a free BSD VM up and running where the scientists would, uh, r uh, the senior scientists specifically, would run any new software that they have uh, into that free BSD VM just for me to know if it's working on free BSD, but this time without the Linux emulation layer. So my goal now is to make sure that free BSD is a, um, a good uh, uh, has good infrastructure for the scientific community natively, right? So a good example of this is I started patching three software to make it compile on FreeBSD. Uh, this has been uh, very much problematic uh, for us, and um, I don't know where I'm going to go after that yet. Uh, but it was unfortunate. However, the, there there was part of the feedback, which is the page that I sent. Uh, which is they liked the uh, infrastructure. So here are the basic things that I got feedback from them. For example, they love quotas. Who doesn't? Reservations. Apparently, they, I mean, it's people know it exists, but for the scientific community, it's important to make sure that an amount of data is available for a project that they know is going to expand to. So other parts of the system don't take over them. Uh, snapshots, obviously, and encryption uh, in the scientific community. There's a lot of personal data, let's say DNA information, native encryption of ZFS, uh, highly uh, recommended. And the, well, the compression is, uh, I mean, each file goes around 20 gigabytes, right? Each project can go to 20 terabytes. So having native compression was also very uh, user friendly. I, I wanted to add replication, but I didn't add it into the table because uh, they don't care, I want to say, about backups as we think as backups. They mostly care about the result of the data, which could be tiny. Uh, so, but again, it's, it, it might be a good thing to know, right? So, you know, the actual um, original data might be like 20 terabytes for a project, but the final result of the research might be a couple of hundred megabytes of a small file. Uh, and yeah, do, do interrupt me. Yes, go on. What they may very much care about in ZFS, the, independent of FreeBSD or uh, Linux, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. uh, starting off from, from a snapshot, cloning it, running an experiment, and either keeping it or discarding it so that they can quickly iterate on a tenth of terabytes uh, file system. That's a very good point, which I have because not brought it up to they them. They probably care about and just don't know that it's possible not to suffer through this is to basically yes. reset everything after they've clubbered things and did them, or that you can have a delegated data set, which is yeah. normally read only so that they can't accidentally yeah. clobber their good yeah. data, but that so that they can only write to their output directory normally that's while they're a... doing their code that's a that's a that's a very good point uh, that i have not mentioned to them at all about the possibility of uh snapshot plus clone we do need to mention that and i do have to point out until me going I further would... just for you to understand the pain 
uh, I looked into how uh, major universities run their infrastructure from a like a DevOps quote unquote point of view. It feels like the cave age, you know, like uh, they they are not aware of isolation, not aware of containers, not aware of uh, modern file system. The most modern thing that they have is like Gloucester FS because they run a lot of clusters. I don't even know if it's even running on ZFS actually. So what they in, in major universities in the US and Europe, what they do is um, they they basically have uh, an NFS mounted everywhere and uh, the user's data are there and the user uses a, uh, what do you call that? A, um, a scheduler uh, or a job manager, such as the Slurm is the most common one apparently. Uh, which does run on FreeBSD, but the latest version starts gonna start or already started relying on C groups, so that that might be an issue for us. Um, and they just submit a job, which is you know a shell script most of the time, and it goes and works on the cluster on multiple nodes, and the data is shared via NFS anyway. Now all of this is absolutely possible on FreeBSD as well, but there is no isolation, there is no limitation. The, their solution of job control is. Uh, oh, we've seen you're been run using this percent of the CPU in the cluster. Uh, we would like to let you know that um, we're going to terminate your process in the next 24 hours. Please back up any data that you have. Like that's their concept of job scheduling, which is like very 1999. The Matrix movie was made like that, you know, not, not, yeah. So, um, uh, and when I show them what we have as an infrastructure, they are amazed. They just don't know the use case and they don't want to learn about the new possibilities. Uh, they don't want to change habit, let's, let's put it that way. Um, okay, so they did love the jail infrastructure, uh, the idea of con containers, and uh, apparently scientists divide into two points. When I tell them, hey, you're going to have a jail per project where it will allow you to have different versions of FreeBSD if you want to, different versions of specific runtimes if you want to, or different environments for projects. Their answer is, but we can already do that on Ubuntu using environment variables. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's, it's a totally different thing. Like in many cases, you can't run the same, different versions of the same application, right? So they don't understand these kind of problems. Uh, although, I mean, package source yeah. could solve their problem. Um, so that's that's one problem with the, with the scientific community is explaining to them what 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 containerization is the most silly um uh, i want to say um excuse that i've heard is that i don't want to run multiple ssh terminals uh for each project you know i want to log in once and work on all the projects all the time you know i'm like that, that that's like the silliest excuse that i got so there's that um, so that's on the jails part. Uh, D-Trace is the next facility that I showed the scientists. They absolutely fell in love with this. Uh, the senior ones specifically, the juniors didn't even get what this means. We did a very basic example of a software that was um, uh, running, uh, running and uh, as the scientists said, didn't work, but it was actually trying to lock a file on NFS while the NFS server didn't have... Uh, uh, RPC locking bind support. using yeah the locking support, right? So uh, then we use D-Trace to show them, oh, okay, so this is what it's trying to do. And this is an actual example that I made made out of, you know, in my own tiny brain, just to show an example for, and yeah, the whole point of this page is to Sorry. move it to the wiki, by the way, to be specific. Um, um, so yeah, yes, go on, Jan. If they have an appreciation for D-Trace, even a very shallow one, you can probably blow their minds if you show them that they can have flame graphs of where this of the really spends its time. Yes. Uh, at least if it's not hidden by some kind of interaction in a runtime. So if for interpreted languages, you may only get by the this part of the interpreter and not the function name, unless there's mm -hmm. a D-trace integration for it, which certainly I think are often lacking in FreeBSD. Uh, the D-Trace team did a, did a great job to write these kinds of integrations for runtimes, but yes. uh, they haven't caught on anywhere in FreeBSD, only in certain parts of the Solaris community at certain times. That, that's a good point. For example, I don't know if our default Python has D-Trace enabled. I know that, uh, Dave, we do have Erlang enabled with D-Trace, right? In the default... Uh... Yeah, as far as I remember, 
So that, that, that you know, like uh, uh, Postgres for some reason is disabled, right? So the Postgres database does not have Dtrace enabled in the default uh, uh, building options. As far as I know, Erlang does have. Python, I'm not aware, although Python does have uh, support for Dtrace. So uh, maybe we should also go over like the main programming languages in FreeBSD and see if Dtrace is enabled or not. And if it's not, why not? Because sometimes it's just a breakage. It's like at the upstream level, not on FreeBSD, yeah. like even at the upstream, it's like not compiling. The Erlang community is, they, they do invest in Dtrace. They have actually a wrapper layer where uh, either it, regardless if it's Dtrace or BPF trace, they, they make sure that those things are working properly. Anyway, so Dtrace was another facility that was very interesting. And um, the, po the ports and the packages, obviously. Now we have scientific categories for those who are not aware. And thank you, Fresh Ports, for printing all of those. We have science, parallel math, geography, biology, astrology. Um, so all of those are, oh, you're connected via IPv6. Mm -hmm. It says at the yeah. top of the page. Yeah. So uh, the, those are, <laughs> uh, those are, um, th those categories are here. Uh, the, some of the tools don't have maintainers, but 99% of the time, the tool is just not updated. A lot of the software in the scientific community gets written once and never updated again. So I think that's very much okay. Um, so we have some good categories for scientists to go over. Uh, from my experience, only 50% of what biologists needs day to day was available in our ports. The other 50% is either Linux only, like even just Git checkout and make didn't work. It's 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 that kind of situation, or it actually relies on Linux runtime, such as Docker. Now, more modern quote unquote scientific communities are basically using Docker, or the other one was called Conda, which does not have FreeBSD support. How's that spelled? Around it, Conda with a C, like the Python. Docker and Conda, yes. Hmm. Uh, so um, Conda uh, is a. A tool, but it's like a wrapper to help you manage your Python, uh, Python virtual environments. Environment. Yeah. Hmm. And but for example, you mentioned that they don't understand. At least the more advanced ones, uh, like, like you described, should, to, are correct that if you're only inside the Python ecosystem and everything you do is accessed through Python, and you only have conflicts between different Python package versions or Python versions, not uh, between with system libraries, uh, then Python uh, virtual environments solve the problems jails solve for the full system for their Python code. Yes, I I know I I, I I know what you're saying. All of us here know what you're saying. But delivering that message to the scientists who don't know what, for example, a shared library is, is very hard. The, that's where things get complicated and. Um, uh, I mean, they don't know, but the new system that's running Gentoo is actually running a, uh, an Ubuntu container. So I saved myself the pain of just in case this happens, at least I can run another Ubuntu container with problem solved. Uh, but uh, th th they don't get the messaging of what uh, what can what problem do containers solve? You know, so th th that's one of the issues. Um, so okay. yeah, but the, but, yes, yes, sir. I'd like to share something with you. We did back at the company. We did uh, a measurement of a distributed file system, and the Blaster FS was not the fastest of them. Uh, just as an info, the MuseFS and FreeBSD uh, was the fastest of all distributed file systems. Which in FreeBSD? Uh, Which? Uh, Muse, uh, M O O S E. Oh, Moose FS, okay. Yeah, Moose FS, yes. Yes. Uh, the second thing, uh, if you search open ZFS for ZFS encryption bugs, there's quite a few. And I think, if not all, the majority is a race, race condition. So be careful with the native encryption. And I, I can say that it's bite us in the ass at work a few times because we still have it on some servers. 
and it's still not production ready as much as Jelly. Okay. Good yeah, do ask me about that at some point, maybe at the one o'clock opens FS call. But yeah, it's been yeah. frustrating and the error reporting is kind of terrible for the receive command. So that, uh, at, but I do hope to bring this up once again at the uh, next month's open ZFS developer summit in San Francisco. You're all welcome to attend. There is one thing I would really, really like to see fixed in ZFS. Yes, and there is a bug with the uh, how it's called sleep and resume and i don't even know how people debug that i think alan jude started something with it but it didn't occur any progress i mean by now they might solve it i just didn't hear about it but yeah like when the host like, sleeps yeah like yeah, you happens? put the laptop for to the sleep yeah well there are some, I think, also race conditions. So, well, bad stuff is going to happen. And the, the, your file system doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Mm, that's um, a good point. The problem is that during sleep and resume, temporarily interesting problems can be visible when accessing the block storage. So, for example, that, oh, no, this NVMe queue has is filled up or doesn't respond for a while. And then you get tons of read errors. I had an SSD and a laptop where during suspended resume, I would get like on every resume, I would get 10,000 read errors and then it's worked again. And there was a workaround for it. And I think it's fixed in 13.1 or something. But um, so yeah, that's what, how, why suspended resume can be a problem for file systems because they observe, for example, all the disks being unplugged and then replugged because the controller reappears or something or re-enumerates the bus or something. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's uh, where, where was I stuck? The, the port three, we talked about uh, that as well for the scientific community. And um, um, fresh ports was very useful for overall because like they 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 were using the web interface of fresh ports to see if a software is available or not. That was also very useful uh, from an ecosystem point of view. Um, but there were other features that was way more interesting. I think the next ones where I got a bit deeper, yes. Resource control. Um, so resource control on Linux with uh, Slurm and job scheduler things, they suck. Huh. Uh, they're very, very awful. I'll, I'll give you a very typical example of this. Um, so if you use a Slurm and you say, hey, this job is going to use 20 gigs of RAM, um, some software, specifically the ones that are written in R, the programming language, um, they use a different mechanism, I assume, for like allocating memory or whatever that they do, and they easily bypass that limit. Uh, on FreeBSD, I did run the same application that was bypassing the memory, basically, and uh, I used I ran it inside the jail and used our resource control uh, RCTL specifically to set the memory limit, and uh, it all worked flawlessly. Now, I don't know if the latest version of a Slurm did fix the issue or not. I will test and report back. But resource control on FreeBSD is way more effective than it is on scientific Linux. Let's put it that way. Uh, does Slurm use soft instead of hard? I, I do not know, Jan, honestly. I mean, Slurm is very common in the scientific community, but uh, the internals of it are very complicated to understand what it does exactly. Um, I ended up actually reading some parts of its source code to get... To, to, to get a better understanding. Another uh, resource management. Uh, yes. Sorry. I remember one more thing. If they're interested how to get started with D-Trace, I don't know if you remember I published a D-Trace kind of like tutorial. I didn't like how hard was it to start because that's the biggest step of, of them all, starting mm -hmm. with D-Trace. So I, I did trace ZFS and iSCSI, I think, and NFS. 
But that's that's really not the point. The point of the post was to show you how tracing correlates to codes, to variable structures, uh, and so on. And how do you, when you say, okay, I have no idea how the code works, how do you even cope with it? There are tons of uh, probes for deep trace and how do you combine them? What do you need? And what does it mean in the end, right? Because it's kind of, you have to know the code to deep trace properly. But I started with a mindset, well, because I didn't have other, of a mindset, I don't know the code. I have no idea what's inside the code. How do you cope with that? And so some smart grappling and knowing how the um, style in FreeBSD works. For example, implementation always has function name all the way left to the left margin. And you can grab smartly. Thank you, Christoph Trost, for, for teaching me that. So... It's a, it's a post on how to actually get with the D-trace, hopefully, and it's awfully written because of some company, blah, 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 uh, but it has a link to the Word document that is formatted better. Can you share that? In a few minutes when I get nope. to my computer. Awesome. Yes. So another feature that I learned about during these calls was uh, CPU sets. Uh, they work flawlessly uh, on FreeBSD with, uh, with with jails as well. Uh, this could be very useful for very large systems like the one that I have with like, uh, you know, 200 something cores, where if you have a static, let's say, resource allocation rather than dynamic, you can say, oh, this project gets this many CPUs and that project gets this many CPUs and do they overlap or not? You can do all oh. of that uh, together with the CPU sets and they also work very well. And the last bit that I did want to add, but I did not add it into, in my document yet, is um, uh, um, idle priority and real-time priority that Jan showed me which is a very good way in the scientific community because sometimes they have these complex, what they call databases. They're actually a uh, indexation, in, indexation. Is that a file? Is that a name? Index, index, Indexing? index. They, 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 where they index um, any kind of DNA data that they will reuse over time. But instead of having the large, uh, you know, couple of hundred gigabytes of a file, it gets indexed and turned into smaller, let's say, you know, 20 gigabytes of a file. And they need those databases to, you know, be updated. But you don't want to, uh, and they take a long time and a lot of resources. So ID Prio that we have and real-time Prio that we have in FreeBSD is a good tooling there for these kind of tasks where you want to run in the background, but without bothering all the other users. Um, you know, we have a command line that's like does that, out of the box and it comes into the base system and um, again works very well and you can run multiple of these in the background with their appropriate priority using you know from minus 20 to plus 20 i guess i guess i guess um, so th those are also good features in resource control uh, that the scientific community might might uh, use uh, but and uh, now i want to go into the problems and if you folks have any solutions yes goran one thing I wanted to interject, but yeah, go on. You're muted. Um, or did... I didn't actually have anything to say. Jan was asking oh. the word. Yeah, uh, what you can do, you don't have to treat CPU sets completely static because you can update the uh, set definition while it's running. You're, so you could yes. start out with a set which is basically allowed to consume all the system and when you uh, just if the system isn't used, used really and if someone else allocates a job, the other CPU set is decreased that requires a bit of uh, tooling but you can update it. It's not like you have to kill the job to uh, reduce. Oh, that's a good CPU point. Set. That is a good point. Yeah. Which, which, by the way, the previous version of Slurm that we were using doesn't do that. Like the one that we have on our 
old systems, but I will check if the new Slum does that. If it doesn't, it's okay. already a huge advantage that you can change a job or in this case a jail while it's running, you know? One of the downsides is of uh, being nice about it and allowing users to access more resources than they have hard allocated is that they get used to things to be better than promised. Mm -hmm. So you will end up in a state where you're not held to the true SLA, but to the imagined, I want it this way SLA. Mm -hmm. This has always worked for me. Why can't I allocate 160 CPU cores? <laughs> uh, so, I remember the thing. When I was switching from Linux to FreeBSD, real time was actually playing a big role. And just to give a context, uh, when I say recently, in the past like five to eight years, Linux got real time support, but FreeBSD had real time support for well, probably forever. The thing that was added recently is for users in a real time group to actually get the real time, not just the, the root. So it became really nice for us musicians running Jack and whatnot. So it, it was a nice addition. I did not know that. That that that's actually very good. Uh, yeah, uh, real time yeah. support yeah. is is I think called as FreeBSD. Okay. So um, um, for for the yeah, yeah go on. So FreeBSD has for a long time has good enough real-time support for audio. But um, before anyone starts building their next uh, multi-copter around FreeBSD, there's a difference between a sub-millisecond and sub-microsecond. So, uh, so, um, so for, the, for the main problem, I would, I would put it this way. Everything until the application stack works flawlessly on FreeBSD. The application stack is our problem when, when it comes to the scientific community. Now, there are two ways to solve this. I tried the first one, the easiest one, which was Linux jails. And I don't think that it, um, my solution was perfect. Um, uh, it was perfect for the users, per se, because they were, you know, they were not aware of what's happening there and their software that you know it, it's not network dependent it basically reads some files and did, does, does some calculations it worked fine but then as an admin i'm having problems because i can now i cannot debug things not everything at least properly um but i mean i would prefer that over linux where the application support might be good but you know their infrastructure is well crappy is the nicest way to put it there uh everything from like it took me a whole day to set up zfs on root on FreeBSD, uh, sorry, on uh, on Linux. Yeah, yeah. But it, 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 it's it's not an easy thing, and I'm sure not a new badman can do that even easily. You know, like I had to use Gentoo mm -hmm. just because I wanted to have complete control. Try doing that with like Debian or something. There is a million thing that you have to do to get it up and running. Although I heard Ubuntu now has support for ZFS out of the box, but I haven't tried that yet. Um, and the second not solution, anymore. <laughs> not anymore. Not anymore. They, they threw away ZFS. Entirely, I thought that was getting some love, but I assume they okay. just remove the boot support hmm. from the default configuration so that you can't boot. Oh, off, maybe uh, maybe the boot or can't have okay. a kernel on ZFS or something. Really? Well, they had two pools. It was kind of funky. So good to know. The same here, by the way, Michael. Unfortunately, I also have to run two pools. I have to run a boot pool and a data pool, uh, or an operating system pool rather, uh, to make it work on Linux. And uh, the, b b so I, I don't know how this is going to continue, but I'll, I'll let the Galat you know on the ZFS calls, apparently. Yeah, small um, note, yeah. Uh, uh, TrueNAS Scale and Proxmox seem to get that right, but no one has followed their example in just an off-the-shelf distro. So such is life. Um, one of the problems is that for licensing reasons, you are not allowed to ship the combination of the Linux sources required to build the module and the derived module and so yeah you can't have you can use it but you have basically you have to mix it locally like you're you're not allowed to chip your tenorite pre-mixed um and, 
Yeah. And and the second solution that I have is maybe write a grant, get some money and uh, pour to one scientific software a week to FreeBSD to the upstream ports and, uh, you know, 50 software. I mean, they, they don't use a lot of software. Let me be clear on that. Like the, the, the number of software that they use programs is tiny. Their environments are a lot. There is like Docker-based environments. There is Conda-based environments. There is God knows what based environments. They have something called NF Core, which mixes all of the environments. The, the scientific community has a lot of tooling, but the actual software itself is tiny. Uh, and um, that's that's what I learned by working with them for the last couple of months, I got to say. And uh, I did have one last point that I wanted to say, which was ZFS um, booting issues, native support. I'll, I'll remember what, what last point that I had to say. Oh, um, and uh, as far as I can tell, uh, another problem that FreeBSD solves for them is Poudrier. So I'll, I'll bring the simplest example. Every scientific community or rather scientific organization ha also have their own in, you know, in-house software, uh, usually written in Python R or uh, Shell. Um, so what do they do? Well, in on every server, they SCP the code. Uh, the smarter ones use Git, right? But uh, I mean, they don't even know what a CI CD is. Let's put it that way. Uh, but if you have something like Poudrier, well, now you can put the software in a single place, put your ear, build it, and ship it to every other server that you have. Uh, try doing that on a Linux environment where you have to think, are all of them running the same version of Debian? Are all of them running the same distro? Uh, what is the, I mean, the, 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 the minimum amount that you can think about there is, you know, maybe package it in a tarball, assuming, of course, that you don't need any kind of dependencies. Um, again, the purpose of my document was to put it into the wiki. So if someone searches FreeBSD for science, it, that will show up, hopefully. Um, so if you have any other feedback for the document, if I missed anything on the infrastructure side, I hope that I didn't, uh, let me know. But the problems, again, it's only application layer stuff, which is very unfortunate uh, that now I have to maintain a Linux box. So, Antranig, are there any yes. super obvious low-hanging fruit options, opportunities mm. like the uh, process virtualization that might give us better Docker support because PID1 can be freed up and virtualized in a jail? Um, or is it just so, a death by a thousand cuts? <laughs> very good point. Okay. So, one of the common scientific toolings that they use is called NF Core. Um, and NF Core... Uh, relies on containers, but not specifically Docker. It doesn't have to be Docker. Mm. I told NF Core to use Podman, which is now available on FreeBSD, and you can tell Podman to use the jail subsystem instead of using the C group or uh, any other subsystem. So it worked as in it pulled the image into a jail and it tried to run it. Obviously, the jail was running Linux, at the, uh, basically, but it didn't run because of you know PID1. It's always PID1. It's always systemd. That's the problem. Now, uh, lately, I have learned that um, you don't need for you don't need to have systemd on the host, even if you're running systemd inside a container, really? regardless if it's Linux, yes. It's regardless if it's Linux or regardless if it's Linux or um, BSD or whatever, as long as you can either do PID virtualization, which I heard that we have a review about that. Oh uh, yeah, Bjorn Zeeb has one, but he's been non-responsive. I was hoping yeah. to see him. Europe. Or you can just emulate C groups. It doesn't even have to be actual C groups. That's what I do on Gen2 because my Gen2 system doesn't run systemd. It runs OpenRC. As long as the C group uh, file system is available, which is, uh, I mean, if, if we have ProtzFS, I, I assume C groups would be easier to implement. Again, I don't know the internals. So uh, th those might be the easiest ways to get Linux jails up and running. But again, from my experience, uh, having FreeBSD support the scientific software natively is way better experience. Yeah. Like just even from a scientist point of view to do like PKG install SAM tools is like, oh, okay, now it's all like DNA tools. It's it's way better to, to do. 
Um, so th those are the things that you know from a low hanging fruit. I, I for low hanging fruit. I think those th those are the ones that do come to my mind. Um, yeah, what use LD preload to lie to system CTL and MU? <laughs> oh boy, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Uh, so but, um... flashbacks here. I mean, <laughs> no, no, uh, that wouldn't matter because uh, the arguments are just two integers, and it wouldn't be in the kernel. You would use an LD preload library uh, to cheat be and basically redefine the kill or uh, system. Um, so the the C function wrapping the kill system call entry. <laughs> So there's a stop function there, and that has a symbol LD preload can take over. And as long as it's not a set UID binary, which would prevent it from being LD preloaded, as long as you have a set UID flag set, yeah, you would, if you have some way to find the process. Yeah. But yeah. Do you think that's workable or just terrible? Uh, it would be nasty, but it would. Rockable but nasty. That's the, my middle name. The problem with the Docker stuff is what people are expecting to do is sit down at a computer and go Docker pull someone else's project from another university and have everything work. And this is very much the behaviour of, of uh, not in a bad way of, of many sort of university-based research projects or scientific projects now that they're just expecting this package set up to come where they can run it. And as we all know previously, it's not Linux. And so every single possible feature that someone uses is another opportunity for someone to have a really bad experience and be told, instead of Docker pull, you need to spend a week figuring out how to build their entire thing from scratch. Um, and that's, yeah. It would be worth speaking to BCR um, um, to catch his, um, his experience working at a university as well. Um, and for the D-Trace stuff, um, I wondered if if, the, if there's a reason why we don't have um, like function boundary tracing available for Linux binaries um, or um, or user space um, D-Trace as well. I don't know. I guess that's that's a good question for the list. So. Um, um... I, I am very uh, well. First of all, I'm very sad that the scientific community lives in the in the Stone Age. Uh, I I know that like it's not their job to be a computer scientist or to understand even how computers work. Um, but we're talking about um, uh, a, how do I even put this in a, in a better terms? Um, they are relying on machinery without understanding how the machine works. And if you tell them that you have to understand these things, they tell the uh, common answer in every scientific community is you don't need to understand how a car works in order to use it. Right. That's, that's the most common answer from the communities. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. Like my, if, I were a scientist, I would like to understand how scientific machinery works, right? But that that might be just a hacker mentality kicking in. Um, is there a way to apply for a grant to uh, port software to FreeBSD? I don't know. I mean, who would be even interested in funding that? Uh, but as far as I can tell, even common tools yeah. like Slurm are funded by Google, NVIDIA, every major research company out there. Uh, they fund all of the Linux scientific stuff. Uh, so I, I don't know how we could do it on FreeBSD. Yes, yes, Dave. Oh, uh, I think you I'm should here. start off with emailing the foundation because oh. um, they fund it directly themselves yeah. to get started, um, but they also have um, contracts and sometimes NDA arrangements, sorry, con contacts as well as contracts with NDAs with all of these larger vendors. Um, and sometimes they just know the right people. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, Jan's, Jan has a good point. Like a lot of people don't know. I assume they don't know how a microscope works, but they do use it uh, in the scientific, uh, maybe, maybe. I mean, uh, 
So, uh, yeah, th th this has been a problem. And again, it's not just a problem of FreeBSD, even on Linux. They're like, oh, this software is not working. And like, I have to go and debug and they don't know like what a lock is or what a process is. A uh, common problem, like my daily problem is they submit a job via a job manager, but they kill it manually. And then the job manager goes crazy. Where's the process? Where's the process? What should I do? Oh, okay. I'm just going to stop doing everything. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, Antrenic, it's, it's terrible. Yes. Is that an opportunity for training docs on well system administration for researchers? Um, I think so. So as far as I can tell, the, um, let's say, scientific communities except uh, highly funded universities, they do not have, uh, quote unquote, senior sysadmins. They basically mm -hmm. have a student who's running yeah. it, who knows, oh, yeah, I run Linux on my desktop. Oh, so probably you can do it on the server too, you know, th those kind of people. Or it's usually someone who's... Um, experience on unix systems is basically uh copy pasting the stuff from uh you know whatever the docs are so uh, th there is a large gap there in the scientific community and as far as i yes. can tell we have we have way better infrastructure than linux for the scientific community and uh, the scientific community members unlike developers they don't care on which environment they run on they're not Developers attached might to it. Be yeah, picky. they want the yeah, data. Just they test to work. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So this um, might be a good place to jump in. You know, it's, it's, it's been 20 years and Linux doesn't do anything there anyway. Uh, probably there's it not does a lot of, of things there, yeah. but not for the smaller ones you're describing that oh. here we have a 2U box in a rack. Uh, go mess with it. This is the situation you're describing, right? What you also have are proper research institutions where either you have it really working or uh, more likely you have the old priesthood of uh, guarding access to their compute resources, which may be either fancy and up to date or they are still guarding the Pentium 4 in the corner. Um, but the problem is that there's a disconnect and oftentimes in universities you have a problem that those doing the operations aren't respected because that you're not work. You don't even have a PhD. You're not even a human. Uh, so um, <laughs> you're just basically uh, cleaning stuff to them, and so they don't. They, some of them really think it's beneath them to learn about it, even to learn it to use it, not to learn it to build on it. So you have a big culture problem there. That, that is true. And, I mean, I, I, I keep telling people in the medical and the science field that uh, honestly, every computer scientist can become like can do what you th you're doing because I mean, philosophically speaking, and sorry if I'm going a bit off topic here that on computers, it's a lot harder than on DNA because we can create whatever we want, you know, and now you have to learn what other people have created. While in case of, uh, you know, science, you're limited to what nature can do. Uh, so for even, even if you do all the possible outcomes, uh, computer science is a lot more harder. And I keep, you know, giving the suggestions, hey, um, don't hire doctors and uh, molecular uh, scientists, hire software engineers and teach them molecular biology. That might be like a faster solution to results. <laughs> or mathematicians even could work, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, honestly. Put two of them together. And yeah. create an environment for them to work together across disciplines. Uh, but that's the um, dream world, not the real world. Okay, the other problem with that getting funding for it is that it's basically unpaid work. And there's no return of investment other than, yay, it works. And you made someone happy, but they're not going to keep paying you for it. So, yeah, it's yeah. a hard sell. Yeah, yeah. But I do have to say that uh, in the scientific community, kudos, they use Unix tools. Like every piece of code that I look into, it's grep, awk, uh, sed. You know, it's it's all the older school Unix tools that you would think about. Uh, everything is done by piping redirection, everything like uh, those, uh, not curl pseudo bash. Now, honestly, I mean, 
luckily not that much although you would see it once in a while obviously yeah of course uh but kudos on that it's it's very well um a unix -y environment you do you know, like windows and mac os they don't have a place in there uh, uh as much as i thought uh everything is done in in unix -y environments and they praise at and labs of the 60s so hmm. we might um, be able to convince them that hey we are an actual you know heritage well, from there. have they heard of berkeley in the 80s that gave us bsd <laughs> but um joking aside um and dns uh, dna data sets uh, one of the nice things about this is that if they are naively represented they compress a lot using zfs compression yes sir you really want to have big record because it's just a very repetitive string yes with a small character set so it you can have compression factors probably going to 10 and above if you have big records, yeah. uh, which could really help get uh, a bigger rocking set into memory because uh, the OpenZFS uh, file system cache is mostly compressed. So what you cache are compressed blocks. Mm -hmm. Any other notes on my document or should I just add it to the wiki as is? I think Except I need the to be that we had. Sorry. Link to it. Make sure that it has been submitted to the Internet Archive because it probably won't crawl your page regularly. So that even if something happens going forward, someone will be able to retrieve a snapshot of your document. Good point. Yes. I will do you do have yeah, a advanced networking. Yeah, place to point go... there, maybe yeah. elsewhere in the wiki? Just thinking uh, out loud. Yeah, I didn't go into advanced networking too deep because it's not in too much into jails or even ZFS, but the, the long story short version is uh, they do use tunnels a lot, like between communities. Um, WireGuard has become very uh, common now, and it's good that we have it out of the box. Linux has as well, obviously. But uh, if, if we get into clusters, now you need some kind of other type of networks, and FreeBSD has good tooling out of the box, such as VXLANs. Uh, currently, I'm using VXLAN internally in the university. I mean, the scientists don't even know that we have VXLAN, you know, so th that's been going very well. Uh, WireGuard, like I said, and um, another, uh, uh, our bridge infrastructure for jails is, is working flawlessly, comparing that to the Linux IP route uh, tooling we have uh, the uh, you know priority there oh and um uh whoever was you know the scientist slash sysadmin he was blown away by the pf syntax after years of doing ipf you know ip tables he's like oh my god this is like unbelievably easy to use um so yeah our networking uh, the the fact that it's easy to use and documented basically let's put it um. that way if you want to make him even happier, tell him that anchors are just other words. So you can have a condition on an anchor. Oh. So that, and this has a great performance uh, impact for rule evaluation as well, because uh, you only evaluate the contents of the anchor if a precondition is satisfied. So you can have an anchor like port equals 80 and then only do the HTTP inspection stuff uh, for, or packets on port 80 and you can nest anchors and then pipe dynamically generated sub rule sets uh, in there and you can have anchors including others with a wildcard so it's really quite powerful to automate for things like runtimes uh, similar to uh, the pod jail mm -hmm. manager already mm -hmm. does that mm -hmm. yes so yeah, this was my uh, scientific experiments for the last two months. Like I said, I'm not happy with the outcome now that I have to maintain Linux. True, but I'm hearing some marketing and training for such communities and they're not against it and you know, they're not hostile. It's, it's you know. Yes, absolutely. There's um, fundamental natural connections there back to Berkeley. So yeah. 95% uh, as... of them mm -hmm. are continuously underfunded, but mm -hmm. they often have time to give. Uh, as far as I can tell, um, uh, the fact that they, that they don't care about the operating system could be our biggest advantage. Yeah. Uh, 
like every every call that we've had before was about penetrating the developer market etc it's it's really hard developers think that they are smart sorry developers you are not uh, as smart as you think but um uh, in this might be the perfect place to i mean we we've conquered the storage now might be a good time to conquer science So I have a quick PF point from 11 hours ago. Christoph mm -hmm. says that uh, Kayatan is working on the open BSD style syntax update. So I don't know who that is, but I know who Christoph is. I don't know who this other person is, but apparently there's an effort to bring FreeBSD more in sync with the open BSD syntax, which is typically the number one complaint people have. So just saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Antrenig, for that. And yes, I suppose post it, but do, do think about what maintenance it requires over time. Uh, let's not recreate the jail wiki page. Yes, agreed. I'll take care of that. Awesome. Um, follow it as well. And yeah, do keep the group uh, updated. If 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 the if the senior scientists do have the time to run one of their commands once in a while, just for me to see. If it's portable to FreeBSD, even without funding, I'll I'll continue to do the. Maybe I'll even have like scientific software ports, you know, uh, scientific ports like the ones that uh, needed or needs updated, needs to be updated, etc. And let's see how that goes. It's 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 an interesting community. I'll just put it that way. Uh, and Antonik, there have got to be universities that are FreeBSD friendly, such that let's find them as allies and. I have I have uh, uh, I have been in touch with some at least whoever my group is working with. Their all of their responses were we're using pfSense, OpenSense, or on routers and ZFS for storage, and then we export to NFS, and the rest is Linux. This so, is the way. Uh, th this is the way that they have. Yeah, I I hope I can improve the situation natively. Great. I really don't. Yeah, Linux yep. jails is not as amazing as we thought. For everything yet yeah but keep um, track of those shortcomings mm -hmm. okay um nothing else on my side small... thank you all. oh thank you i have a small update yes i've seen the OSD, uh OSD is already used in jail so i'm gonna try that first the link will have to wait okay because it's a company blog and uh scratch this but it requires password right now we did something yeah. wrong so uh, when it becomes public again i'll share it and you said and there OSI was i or os what is supported in freebsd osd osd yeah object specific data i think yes <clears throat> so there is one thing that buggy in freebsd that i know of and when you resize your Z wall that is exported as iSCSI target to CTL, uh, reloading CTLD will not pick up the change. So you have to restart CTLD. And I can assure you it's going to be fixed because. It's an issue I'm working on at work, but something to to just be aware of. I would be curious if TrueNest does anything unique there, because that does sound like one of their fundamental features. Um, you can use CTL admin, I think, to update the size uh, of a. Uh, the Z Z V size uh, CTL the CTL layer knows about it, so there's a way to push it in. But yeah, resizing doesn't automatically picked up because there, I think there is a message in SCSI to notify about this, but it's not generated. Same problem with VidIO uh, SCSI. You have to rescan to learn about size changes. So wh what about CTL admin? What what would you do? Um, you can, I think you can assign the uh, the size of the um, LAN there. 
Oh so, yeah, you uh, can in the config. So yeah, probably in the, in the command line interface. interface. So you could, if you get the, and then somehow you could cobble it together, but it would be good if it gets noticed. Uh, there should it should be possible to for CTLD if it exports a device, like the the wall device, to get notified via KQ. Uh, v node, so event filter equals V node, and then there is a ex I think the extend event or the attribute event. One of the possible filter events should trigger when a device is resized, so that you can get notified about local file changes or file cha size changes without having to resort to polling. Okay, my ticket sounds. Thanks for reloading. So that's probably what I'm going to do. And while fixing reloading, I will probably learn how to reread the size. But maybe I come up with a workaround because I didn't even look at the CTL admin, to, to be honest. Anyway, do you reach out to Jan and company regarding that and do see what Trunaz is doing? Mm -hmm. Dave, you have some GSOC updates? Oh, yeah. So the, the GSOC thing was just regarding an earlier discussion. So um, talking with Christoph um, at EuroBSDCon, he mentioned that one of the problems they have with... Um, Dev D notifications and envy lists is just the sheer volume of messages they need to send from PF when a uh, user land process does something like requesting all the states. And he was looking at Netlink as a way of handling some of this. I'm not familiar with Netlink, Netlink but there's the links for other people who want to have a look. Um, um, I did look into this yeah. because it came up for my state notification idea. So Netlink would be a way to do it. Exactly. But so Netlink uh, has recently made the way from Linux to FreeBSD. It's a protocol for communication between mostly user space and kernel or kernel to user space. Potentially also between user space processes, but that's an uncommon usage. But it's possible. Um, KQ, uh, sorry, KQ. Um, Netlink, um, yeah, is implemented in 13.2. A bit, a bit more has been added in 14.0. It's still considered optional, so basically, the system has to work without it. That could change in the future, but so far, it's only an optional, nice to have addition. Uh, and one of the good things about Netlink is that it's really designed to support bulk exports from the kernel like for things like dumping firewall states, uh, which can go up into the millions of states. And you don't want to do it in a single message. So the nice thing about um, Netlink, which is better than how you would use NVList intuitively is that it supports streaming updates into lots of reasonable sized messages instead of one giant message. Because you don't want to have the kernel allocate a giant NV list containing a copy of all the firewall states. That would be a very a bad design. Um, yeah, so you could do, uh, there already is an experimental DFD integration to Netlink in 14, so that you have a ne generic Netlink family for uh, DFD events, but it's only a best effort one, so it can drop messages. And there, there are looking, or someone looked into adding support for injecting messages from user space which would be really nice to have because right now you can't do that. Mm, yeah. But for my state synchronization idea, I 
looked around what's possible. So Netlink is one of the more complex to implement, uh, but potentially very flexible and fast options. Another easy one to implement would have been to go with a dedicated state tracking daemon and just talk to it over a socket, preferably a unique socket. Um, but for now, I'm testing if it's possible to get away without any daemon at all by just relying on KQ uh, file change notifications on a tempfs. The nice thing is that you don't need a daemon. You just need a tempfs mount point. And uh, I want to have an MQTT-like uh, syntax so that you can have a single level wildcard uh, and a suffix wildcard. Uh, and you just subscribe to it in a library and get not notified every time something matching you, you, you're subscribed to uh, basically um, yeah, gets changed. And note the last recording for a good rundown on your proto yeah. your vision for that. Yeah, so the idea is that I want to make it possible to um, subscribe to notifications about changes of the system state. I don't care about the history, not even necessarily about uh, preserving the perfect ordering, just that this part of the system state changed, respond to that if you want. Yeah. Yep. So that you can have loosely coupled components reacting to each other. Keep it coming. Cool. So uh, Dave pointed out that the EuroBSD con uh, videos are starting to appear. And I noticed just yesterday or this morning that the list of talks and PDFs are available in a nice, simple directory. <laughs> uh, and Mohammed, if you're still on, uh, you brought up a topic about how we should archive meetings. And we did talk about, about uh, documentation in general at, at EuroBeehiveCon. Uh, do I understand that you might be happy to help manage the archiving? If it's not sure. obvious, I just copy the page to a, a second page, either by year or six months, and just say, okay, we move on to the current one and just kind of keep it moving, which is not mm -hmm. optimal. Uh, and one point I will keep making is that the, the mining of that information that Dave is doing is invaluable because there are definitely gems in there and I'd prefer extract those gems than just relive certain aspects a few a year ago. But um, mm -hmm. I do know there's the FreeBSD GitHub page on calls, but mm -hmm. it, it, I guess we're all totally open to ideas. Antonik has had to leave, so let's not talk about that today, but I'll definitely make okay. a note that you are interested. Okay, thanks. And rephrased, I don't have a magic wand on that because, hey, it's it's a fire hose of information. And mm -hmm. uh, one other topic was that Antrenig is hoping to see some amount of timestamps on the videos tied to perhaps a doc. So that would be quite handy because the YouTube mm -hmm. tools have become much better about that. I don't know what would be lost on PeerTube, et cetera. So it's not a super simple problem to solve, but I, I totally appreciate your interest in improving the situation. Other topics, uh, we are down to, 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 to please download the Okay. Uh, I know that some of you want to talk Time Machine perhaps on the channel after the rest of us go. Uh, I will be losing power soon, so there's that. So other topics while we're together? Well, I won't argue with that. Um, how about I call the official meeting and then if you want to stick around, go for it. Yes, please. Cool. Yeah, I want the meeting over, but I'm gonna stick around. Cool. Because I, 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 I wanna tire out Ian by asking him questions. Good Understood. Uh, well then, thank you everyone. There's the official goodbye. My dog says my meeting is over, so sorry. That is a perfect end. <laughs>